seven good mailing lists. If you mail letters out and people call you, that's the best customer there is, except if they call, no, that's not true. Direct Mail Marketing Association says people who respond to letters are the best, best, brightest customers. Second to that is people call off radio. Last is email. <laughs> Every knucklehead fills out a form online, and you call them, oh, what, you, what form? I, I don't remember filling out a form. You ever get one of those? They're terrible customers, people who fill out forms on the internet. Uh, if you mail something to someone, a targeted mailing list, and they call you back, you have a really high chance of making a deal. And even if they act unmotivated, they called you for a reason. Even if they act like they're not motivated over the phone, they are. They called you, they're just not revealing it yet. So the first one is the non-owner occupied or absentee owner list. These are people, according to tax records, that don't live in the house. The mailing address of the tax bill is other than that. Now, <clears throat> could be a landlord, could be kids living rent free, that's a good one. Could be out of state, you know, you could filter them by out of state zip codes or out of, you know, the, the out of, not in the state. Um, those are even better, out of state air, uh, owners as opposed to within the state but not living in the house. That's second, but there's just not, there's not enough out of state owners to really effectively market in a sub-market. So you can go to all dine owner occupies. Uh, this tends to be a very good list, a very, very good list. Uh, consistently, we've gotten good ones. Hit or miss sometimes, sometimes mail, we get you know, small response, but generally speaking, over a long period of time, dine owner occupies are good, because not everyone wants to be a landlord. Some people are accidental landlords. You know what I mean by that? They got a job transfer, they couldn't sell it, they had to do it got a divorce, didn't know what to do with it, so they rented it, kids living there, you know, it's not something really where we want it to be. Okay, especially when you look at Craigslist and you see for sale or rent, that's, that's screaming to you, a lease option or something like that, or an owner carry sale, because they're, what they're saying is, I don't want to be a landlord, I hate it, I really want to sell the house, but I can't afford to carry the payments while it's vacant. And nobody wants to rent a house where it says, you must be willing to show it to potential buyers. <laughs> Nobody's gonna rent it, because they don't wanna be thrown out in three or six months. Does that make sense? So those are great ones to call. And, you can, and it's very simple. You go in the for rent by owner section of Craigslist, and you can search a word through there, search sale. Now you'll get some false positives, like you know, at Shady Acres, we're running a sale this month on apartments. But you'll get anyone who puts for sale or rent, sale or lease, must be also for sale. Just put the word sale and see what comes up. And you get a lot of, a lot of those. Those are really, those are the first people you should call. The out-of-state owners, again, uh, you're gonna have to broaden your area a little bit because there's just not as many out-of-state owners. You know, the first thing I did, when I moved to Colorado in 93, um, yeah, you know, I remember walking into a realtor's office and they're like, you can't buy homes for you know, 60 cents in the dollar. You can't, you maybe get a 5% discount, because it was like market was now, it's kind of hot and on the way up. And like, you can't do that, that doesn't work, blah, 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 blah. One realtor asked me to fill out a, a financial statement before I made an offer. I laughed in their face. Uh, and I went to realtor after realtor and they said, like, no, it's not possible. You're not gonna find deals like that. They just don't exist. It's all right. Pulled off the tax rolls, downloaded every out-of-state owner in the metro area, the five metro counties, and mailed 14,000 postcards. Real simple one. You know, cash for your house, no brokers, no banks, no BS. And it wasn't fancy, it was a white postcard. I just went to the post office and got postcards. They're free, right? Because you buy the postage, you get the stock for free. And I printed out a message, you know, off my computer, brought it to an offset printer, and they just printed like offset right on those things. Mangled a few, but. <laughs> but it was a basic message, and I just mailed out 14,000. That could be busy for a year and a half out of that. I did like 18 deals out of that. It was incredible. Um, and, um, you know, what I do to get? Well, people are a little more savvy because of the internet, and Zillow and all that crap. You know, sell sellers are still a little deluded in thinking Zillow says 250, they're entitled to 250. Um, it's a little tougher, but you know, as a numbers game, I think it's effective. You know, people do these fancy, glossy postcards. They don't work. Forget it. They don't work. You got to get personal with people. You got to get you know hokey a little bit with people. You might even want to just take white postcards with the American Eagle on them and just take a sharpie and handwrite, "Dear Bob, call me about your house." Blah 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 blah. 
the more personal, the more hokey, the more, you know, just you and them, that connection, as opposed to this professional, slick looking postcard. You know, keep it simple. You know, people were offended when I said that, no BS. I actually had two or three call people say, I'm offended by that. Yeah, and you have a house for sale or why? <laughs> Probates. Uh, there's two sides to the probate. You can hit the probate list early and get in touch with the lawyer, the administrator of the estate, the heirs. Okay? Uh, you get the first crack at it. My experience has been it's very difficult uh, because it's wrong. You know, it's, it's, it's too new, people are upset. Plus, it's complicated because you're dealing with the estate and there's legal implications of dealing with an estate. I find it's much easier to wait till after the property has been inherited by the heirs. And when they do that, there's a uh, what's called a personal representative's deed, a PR deed. So the representative of the estate is appointed by the court, signs a deed from the estate to the heirs. Now the heirs own it, free and clear in most cases. Okay, Those are the people we go after. And because there's a PR deed on record, we can pick that up, get a list of that, go directly up to those people. And even though it's late in the process, you know, if they haven't sold it by then, good chance you're gonna make a deal. You know they got the property because of the deed. Whereas when you go up there in a state, like all the estates when they just opened, you don't know who has real estate. So, plus, you know, in, in our neck of the woods, it's tough because um, it, Colorado's just messed up. Like some counties allowed, like Denver County will sell you the file, the whole file, for five bucks a file. That's too much. Because only one out of every five or six may have enough property. Okay? For Arapahoe County, they won't even give it to you. They say it's sealed or something like that. I'm like, what are you talking about? Denver gives it out. It can't be a different rule by county. It's got to be a state rule. You go to Jefferson County, it depends who you talk to. So it's a mishmash. You know, it's a mishmash. But the consistent way to do it is the, there's a record of the deed going from the estate to the heir. You can buy that list and then market to those people. Uh, foreclosures, very difficult list. Either you catch them really early, or you catch them really late. Now the problem with catching really late is there are 119 payments behind. So the only option is a short sale, and the sale date is Tuesday. So good luck getting on the phone to try to get an extension. It's tough. Ideally, you want to hit them early as possible. But the problem is, is that most people aren't right yet. They haven't experienced enough pain in the attic. If you're going to hit them, hit them both. Hit them early, hit them late. Uh, I would also recommend following up. If you're not going to follow up with more marketing and door knocking and all that, don't bother mailing to foreclosures. If you, has anyone ever visited someone in foreclosure at their house? Have you seen the box? The box of stuff they got? No. This is all the mailers I have, a whole box. Bankruptcy attorneys, real estate brokers, mortgage brokers, investors. Scam artists, I mean, there's like a hundred pieces of mail in their box. They didn't, they're up to here with it. So it's not very effective, okay? I'll, we'll talk about uh, foreclosures in a minute. Uh, mortgage lates, all right, it, it's, this has been inconsistent, but we've had some success with this. These are people who are 30, 60, 90 days late, but no default notice has been filed, no list pendants, nothing like that, okay? So it's not public record for everyone to see, although you can buy this list at Experian or PRW or wherever the credit bureaus are, compile this information and they sell it. Okay. Um, what's nice about mortgage lates is you can dial them in. You can say, I only want properties with firsts and seconds, where the second is at least 20% so I can negotiate the second off. Or I want ones with interest rates of 6% or lower so I can cure them and take them subject to. You can get real specific with the mortgage lates. The challenge I've had with these is that they're not very accurate. I've had a lot of people call and go, what are you talking about? I'm not late. What are you talking about? I've never been late. They could be lying. Or the, the people who sold me the list was monk. <laughs> I'm not sure. Or just the nature of the beast. Uh, but, you know, I've got deals from it. Not as good as the, not on occupied seems to be the, and the out-of-state owners seem to be the two best in the probate, the first three. Um, number six, free and clear or high equity owners. This, now, theory, in theory, this would be owner carry deals where someone could carry the mortgage free. The problem is, is it's, it's the list is misleading. 
If someone buys a house cash, it's, it's a free and clear owner. So if they refi it the next day or they resell it, they're not really a free and clear owner, are they? So instead of buying a list that are advertised as high equity or free and clear, it might make sense when you're searching, this, I combine this with the not owner occupied, is look for people who've owned the house at least 10 years. Because unless they refi, in theory, that's an equity. Or go for people who's homeowner and they're age 50 and over. Okay? And then you run into other problems, you know, people who are way up there in age, you know, I didn't understand, I didn't know you took advantage. You know, some people just don't, won't, won't do it to deal with anyone over a certain age just because of that. But I think that's, that's silly. That's silly. Unless they come across as a wacko, they, you know, if they're 89 years old and they seem like they're one foot in the grave, maybe you want to get a relative to step in and make sure that they're of sound mind, get a power of attorney or something like that. Uh, and number seven, this is a, new, a rather new list that some of the brokers are selling called, a, a, basically, it's a credit concern customer. You know, the, 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 the credit reporting bureaus run all kinds of algorithms, you know, to kind of predict behavior, and they market based on that. So, based on algorithms of your spending and your credit card use and your mortgages, they can predict with relatively good accuracy who's, who's in danger of defaulting soon. And they sell that information to credit bureaus, I mean other creditors, so they say, shut this person down, they're probably going to go to bankruptcy soon, because of their spending habits, we can tell. Okay. And, but they haven't defaulted on their mortgage yet. Haven't defaulted on their mortgage yet. It's an expensive list, but I haven't tried it myself, but one of my students tried it and got an enormous response, 20%. Got an enormous response. Okay. The other thing is hitting, um, you know, you can choose price range usually by assessed value. You know, even though I said assessed value is not real, it gives you a ballpark, you know, for who you're going to mail to. You can also pick by zip code. That, that'll tell you what it's worth. Um, but like Joe, you know, Joe went to a high-end list, high-end uh, homes for the area. And even though a lot of them were worthless, you did get a huge response because there's many more motivated people with 500, 600, 700, 800,000 dollar homes than there are motivated sellers of 200,000 dollar homes. Does that make sense? And got some, you know, he got some pretty profitable deals out of it. But um, how many, I mean, what, how many calls did you get? How many mail, mailers did you mail? Mailed 750, got about a little over 250 responses. Wow. A third response. You could offer free pizza and you wouldn't get a third response. Yeah. That shows you how motivated that list was. That was a good list. Um, but a lot of them were crap. You know, no, they were all good. They were all good. Like yeah, motivated I sellers. just didn't have time to actually get to all of them. <laughs> when that happens, you call me. I mean, you know what I mean? I'll help Or just wait for the, just call back the people who call twice. But that's what we did, because I remember yeah. I came in and, and you said, all right, we'll just wait until they call back two, three, four times. And yeah, and you start with the most motivated people first. Right? <laughs> people call two and three and four times. Yeah. Uh, I'm still getting calls. You're still getting calls? Two years later. That was almost two years ago? <laughs> I got a call from a guy like almost a year later after I did a mailer, the no BS thing. And um, that was that house over in Baker District. Remember that one? The little house oh, in Baker. The guy when you stole his train? Yeah, you remember that. So uh, <laughs> the guy calls me up and it's like it's like uh, you know one of these early season storms that's coming in. It's rolling in big, big snowstorm. And he says, I, I've been I've been holding on to your postcard for a year. I'm waiting for my transfer. Um, I don't remember was Comcast he worked for or the phone company. He's waiting for a transfer to Phoenix. And he goes, I just got it. My truck is packed and I'm ready to go. And I said, Well, what's the deal? He goes, Well. It, it's a it's a little home in Baker District. This was before Baker District in Denver had turned. It was still kind of a crappy neighborhood, um, but it was this little junky 1920 bungalow, um, and it was a mess. He done he done all kinds of hokey work. He started like tearing out walls that never finished. So um, he calls me up and he says uh, he says uh, basically uh, I bought this for my buddy. It was a VA loan. It was one of the old VA assumables, freely assumable VAs, like went back from the 80s. And uh, I gave him, he um, said, I gave him three grand and I took over his loan, because those were assumable back then. Uh, it was probably only four years left on the mortgage at that point, because it was so old. And he said, I said, so what do you want? 
He says, well, if you can give me four grand, um, I'll deed the house to you. I said, what do you owe? He says, 25. Hello, hello. And I did like a Bugs Bunny. Zing! In front of his door. <laughs> four grand in hand. <laughs> Brought a deed with me. He's had him sign it right over the kitchen table. Uh, didn't do a title search, didn't do nothing. I just, I mean, it was too good to be true, right? I mean, almost. The house, I knew the house fixed up was worth what, at least a hundred. Even at that time, it was worth at least a hundred. Um, and he wanted four grand to take over and assume the board that didn't require any qualification on my part or anything like that. He wasn't a, a good rental candidate, but it was a good way to get in without a hard money loan and just fix it up and turn it over. Um, and basically, so he left half his stuff in the house. He says, I'll come back for two weeks. So um, I called Bob, and uh, Bob said, uh, Bob knew I was in the market for a new car. <laughs> it was that Beamer. And uh, so I had my eye on this Beamer, you know, and he goes, I'll give you, what did you say, you give me 10 grand? I gave you 10 grand for the 10 grand contract. for the deed. He goes, for the deed, it wasn't even a contract, it was yeah. just a deed, and I left the grantee blank. Because I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with it, because I was like, maybe I'll sign it to somebody else, maybe I'll put my entity. So I just put him as grantor, I left grantee blank, and he signed a blank deed. Does that give me legal ownership to the home? Sure it does. Whatever rights he has. Whatever rights he has. He gave me, it was a warranty deed, he gave me a full warranty deed. He signed a seller. Now, if I checked title and things were bad, I'd be in trouble. I'd be out four grand. But I was willing to take that risk. It was a good enough deal. So uh, I went and checked, and everything was good. Title was good. Everything was good. The loan was current. You know, I didn't check anything beforehand. I usually wouldn't do that, but you know, when a deal like that looks you in the mouth and in the face, you know, take your chances. The worst thing I was out four grand. Best best part about it was I went to uh, to Bob Club. He says, ten grand. You can have that car. <laughs> no headaches then, right? He, he appealed to my greed glance. I didn't do anything on the house, so I'm like, all right, I'll do it. So he gives me 10 grand, I give him the deed, he fills in his company. Uh, and then he, you know, he didn't even get the keys, he busted in the window, started doing the work, and like ripping out walls, and he's like, what's all this stuff? You know, he, he, I guess I didn't convey the message, don't touch this guy's stuff, he's coming back in two weeks. So he had all these like, little German toy trains that were worth a lot of money, I think. And you were like all ready to throw them out. <laughs> we did. We we found his trains and we set those aside, and we started work on a weekend. Was the problem? My guys were like ready to go. Yeah. We, you can do a lot of demo. It might take a long time to fix a house up. But demo. You can quick. tear one up, yeah, <laughs> up walls and stuff in just a few days. Yeah. And we used to sometimes do that during a quiet time anyway. Yeah. Before we were but he came back and he was a little pissed. But we had kept those. You did. We use gave them to him and he was happy. Okay. Good. I thought you threw out his trains. Yeah, we found. Them. Okay. <laughs> My trains. <laughs> I had a guy like that. I bought a house from the same thing. He said, I'll, you know, I have some stuff in the barn. It was like a barn garage. It was unlocked and he had piles of just, he was a hoarder. It was just piles of crap. And so I rented it out to a tenant. And I got a call about, I don't know, about a year later from the seller who's in California. And he says, he threw out all my stuff. I go, what are you talking about? It's touch your stuff. He goes, uh, the neighbor told me that your, your tenant had a garage sale. Oh, he probably did. So I asked my tenant, do you have a garage sale and some of that guy's stuff in there? He goes, no. Well, he ended up just lying. <laughs> so I said, I called him up and said, I don't know what you're talking about. It wasn't locked. You know, anybody could have taken it. And it was, I remember seeing this stuff. It was just a bunch of junk. He's like, it's my life stuff. And it was so important. What was it sitting in an unlocked barn halfway across the country for a year? <laughs> so he sues me in federal court, like four years later. I get a summons from a, from a marshal, federal marshal served me. You know, I mean, he was so far beyond the statute of limitations that the judge just threw the case out. But it was crazy. People are crazy, you know. Sometimes you get sellers who just uh, just go off the deep end. So don't throw away the seller's stuff. That's right. the lesson of this story. All right. So the thing about mailers, and we'll talk about you know, like what to put in a letter, what kind of letters is. Uh, I keep it generic. You know, I used to have a targeted list. Say, if you don't own the property, you live elsewhere, you know, call me. If you just inherited a property, call me. And what I found was it didn't really matter. Uh, if I personalized it enough to the property, referencing the property in the neighborhood, my desire to buy, or sense of urgency, and then the call me, I could figure out which list it came from by, by the conversation. And because so I wanted to track, you know, where it came from. If you're mailing 100,000 pieces a month, you want to track it. 
when you mail it out maybe 500 to 1,000 pieces a month, you can figure it out. You know, don't get crazy with the tracking. Uh, I know people do that with like, you know, press one and press two, so they don't get tracked where it came from. That's silly. 500 pieces a month, you, you'll figure it out from the conversation. Yeah, my mom just died up in the south. Yeah, I guess they came from the probate list. Or my kids are living there rent free. Well, they live there and I don't know. I'm in Bakersfield, California. Well, that's the outstanding over list. <laughs> it's not that hard to figure out, right? Uh, but I use the same letter for every list. I don't change the letter. I just came up with a good letter that works, and it works. And it's, it's generic enough, but personalized enough um, that it works. That it works. All right? So nine tips for effective mailings. So once you choose a list, handwrite or type it, but make sure it's personalized. Personalization is the key. Generic letters, like the postcard, you know, the no banks, no brokers, no BS. It was kind of a little hunky and cute. Uh, but I think a, a Sharpie with a handwritten message would probably work better. Dear Bob, I'm interested in your house I drove by at 231 Main Street over in Shady Acres subdivision. My wife and I are really looking to pick up a house in there quick. And we need to move on this quickly, so please call me or email me. Now, what did I just say? I said nothing. What did I imply? I implied I drove by his house, I saw it, I want to move in it, and I want to move quickly. I, did I say that? I did not say that. I said, I was, I happened upon your property, 221 Main Street. Did I say I drove by it? No, he just assumed that's what I said. My wife and I are looking for a house in Shady Acres. What am I implying? You know the neighborhood. That I want to move into it. But did I say that? No, he just read that. You understand? And I really need to move quickly on this. So he, what did he hear? I need to move quickly out of my current house into this house. Uh, so. I didn't say that. I said I need to move quickly on this. Not I need to move out of my house quickly. You understand? So he, that type of letter, you know, as opposed to I'm an investor, I can pay all cash, I buy ten houses a month, I'm so great. Those letters don't work because bragging letters don't work. Or come across the big shot, and I, I'm a big money bag, and I can buy your house quickly. It doesn't seem to work very well. You know, a lot of people do it, but it doesn't work very well. The, the house, the, the, the personalized thing about, you know, dear Bob, your house at this address, it seems to work very well. And it doesn't matter which list you're mailing to, because the probate list, quite frankly, I've, I've mailed the probates and said, I'm really sorry for your loss, this time's difficult. You know, your family, I'm really sorry for your loss. You know, if you want to get rid of this quickly and get no headache, I would get people call me up screaming at you vulture, you this, you that. I mail this one, it looks random. It looks random, they're not pissed at all, they call me up. See how they do this? And I put in the letter, because what's the first question they ask when they call? How'd you get my name? I say in the letter, uh, I was driving by 230, I mean, uh, I happened upon 231 Main Street, and I looked up the owner from public records, I hope you don't mind. So he doesn't get all suspicious, right? So what I'm implying and what he's hearing is, I was driving by, I saw your house, I looked up the owner, I really want to move there, my wife and I, that's not, none of that is true. He just, that's what he's hearing, that's what he's seeing, that's what he's reading. In his mind, he's seeing that message. And it seems to work very well. It seems to work very well, okay? If you can figure out other ways to personalize it, great. I've heard about people putting pictures of their dogs in there, and their kids, and their family, and you know, putting a lollipop in there and make so it's lumpy. You know, so the mail is lumpy, so you want to open it because it's lumpy. Except uh, it doesn't work very well when you, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, that's the, the problem with that. I used to do lumpy mail, and uh, uh, I was on uh, the post office wall, ne right next to Charles Manson's most lumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Put a number, you can be reached at easily, that's the key. People, you know, they get more than one mailer, they go to, when they're urgent, they'll call and they won't leave a message, and then you didn't get the message. Put a number you can be reached at easily, like your cell phone, direct, okay? Put a sense of urgency and a call to action. So you wanna make it sound like, listen, I really need to move quickly on this. I really like the house. So you have a sense of urgency and an incentive for them to call. Call me, please, email me, a call to action. Handwrite the, the article. No matter what you do, even if you type the letter, handwrite the envelope. It gets open more. Don't use a number 10. It looks like junk. Okay, use, a, use an invitation envelope. 
paint, purple, fuchsia, whatever. It looks like an invitation. Like, oh, well, we got an invitation. Okay. A live stamp. I like like Marilyn Monroe, Elvis, you know. Marilyn Monroe is good if it's a guy because it's sex. It's sex sells. Sex is enticing. <laughs> if it requires more than one poster stamp, then put a, an Elvis pen in Marilyn Monroe just to cover all bases. Hmm. Don't meet her. Don't bulk mail it. Don't do anything like that because you're just going right into the trash. Don't use, don't use um, typewritten addresses. Don't use labels for God's sake. You can spend all that money and stick a label on there. It's guaranteed to go in the garbage. Okay. Lumpy mail. So this is where you put like a lifesaver or something in it. You know that makes it lumpy. When makes more people curious, want to open a rubber band. Um, the problem is with that when they sort it through the machines, they tend to get caught in the machines and they get really pissed. I did a lumpy mail thing like a thousand pieces, and they just threw it in a box and just handed it back to me. Then go screw yourself. <laughs> and I wasted like a thousand bucks on that. They wouldn't take it back. And it's like, it won't go through our machines too bad. So that, there's a danger in lumpy mail. Just be careful about that. However, uh, by the way, switch up your methods often too. So if you're going to, if you hit a list and you get a reasonable rate of response, and I think 3% is reasonable. 5% is better. But if you get 3% response, that's 30 calls out of a thousand. That's acceptable. That is accepted. You can make a whole business out of that. Okay? Mail to that list again. But something different. And keep mailing until it drops below 2% and then stop mailing it. Because a lot of people need to see your message three, four, five, six, seven times before they respond. Okay? But if you if you if you mail to a list and you get one percent, don't mail it again. It means this means either your message stinks or the or the list stinks. Okay? So if you get three, four, five percent, like Joe with the 30, 35%, I would have had a letter out every week to that list until it got down to 10% or 5%. What would you do with the other 196 leads? Tell them to go away. <laughs> <laughs> you want to sell that list to somebody here? <laughs> um, and don't mail on holidays. No one pays attention between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Don't mail that during those time periods. Don't mail so it receives on a holiday or a weekend or a Sunday or Saturday, whatever. Um, what I recommend you do is a place in the mail Friday or Saturday gets their Monday or Tuesday. People are most stressed on Mondays. That's when you want them to call. So you want it to be ideally in their hands on Monday, if not Tuesday. So if it's local and you put it in the mail on Friday, odds are they're going to get it Saturday or Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. I also change their first name if they have a name like William or Joseph, um, and I change their name to Bill. Right. So, yeah. Uh, that way, it's not their legal name; it's the, right. the name they go by. That's a good. That's good. That's a good point. I would do that. Yeah, unless they go by William, then they know yeah. it's. <laughs> but more often than not, you're right. If it's Joseph, they're gonna go by Joe. Right. If it's Richard, you can put Rick or Rich. Something like that. Uh, yeah, it's reminding me. I got. Piece of mail once that was just brilliant. I, I save a lot of direct mail I get that's good. I have a drawer full of direct mail because I'm really into that stuff. And this one guy, um, it looked like it was cut out of a financial paper. It was like Financial News World something. It was no, it was no such paper. Mm -hmm. He just printed it on newsprint to look like an ad from a paper about a, a financial seminar that was coming up. Folded it up, put a post note that said, "Bill, you got to check this out, J." Mm -hmm. And then. And he must have took, maybe he must have like printed them about this thick and took a freaking hacksaw and just hacked the edges so it looked like he tore it out of a paper, folded it up, put the post it note, put it in an envelope, no return address, handwritten address to me, and I opened it up and I'm like, oh man, he got me. That was a good piece of direct mail. Mm -hmm. I'm first like, Jay, Jay, John, Jay, John. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I'm like, I read the newspaper name that I said all on the bottom and the top. It's so like News World Financial Times. I'm like, there's no such paper as that. <laughs> they just made it up. I said, but what a brilliant piece of marketing, though. A brilliant piece of marketing. You know, stuff like that is very, you got to get people curious to open it up. You know, everybody gets junk mail, you know. And, uh, you know, 80, 90% of what you get in the mail is what? Junk. Or bills. And most people don't even get bills anymore. They're e bills You know, automatic payments. So. You gotta get creative, you gotta get unique, you gotta be personal, you gotta shake it up. Um, I think I had, no, before that. Um, 
in terms of mail, you know, it's another option is to instead of a, uh, uh, invitation envelope, they have these things called fake FedExes, you ever seen mm -hmm. them? They get priority super express, you know, there, there's no such thing. Uh, but they look for priority, but when you get one of those, what do you want to do? <laughs> you want to open them up, right? Especially that you can love those, make those lumpy, and those work really good. Put something in there, makes it lumpy, and people will definitely open it up. That's like the matrix, you the phone, you know, <laughs> you just want to open it up. Um, but they're a little more expensive, obviously. They, they, they cost about a quarter each, but to mail them, yeah, I think, you know, you can go regular mail and not priority, but it's a little more expensive to mail, but they're a good piece. I did a piece once, I did a limited piece once. I've just been dying to repeat it, I just haven't had a chance to do it, but uh, it was four closures. And it said, uh, it was in a fake priority envelope. And it said, uh, Dear Joe, uh, I have three solutions to your foreclosure problem. Enclosed are two of them. Two lottery tickets. Good luck. <laughs> P.S. If it doesn't happen for you, call me on Thursday and I'll give you the third solution. Now that was really good. That, that, that was very, I got some people call me up and just laughing. You know, so that was really funny. And But the, here's the key. Knock on the door to follow up. You say, remember me? I'm the one who sent you the lottery tickets. It takes the pressure right off. Because you know, when you're knocking on the door, those first 10 seconds, if you don't say the right thing, you're going to slam the door in your face in the foreclosure. If you say, hey, it's Bill. I, I sent you those lottery tickets. How did it work out? And they laugh. They go, well, you're the guy. It, it's, but you kind of follow up with the, with the door knock. If you don't follow up with the door knock, it doesn't really do much. Okay. P.S. S. If you win, I'd like 10%. <laughs> and buy me a house, too, <laughs> while you're at it. All right, so now, flush out the marketing. You gotta be consistent about it. That's the thing, consistency is the key. 500 pieces a month if you can afford it, 200 pieces a month if you can't afford it. If you can afford it, 1,000 pieces a month, 10,000, whatever. Is There's no lack of funds you can spend on good, effective marketing that's responding. You can't spend too much money on that. 